about five after. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started and then admit more people as they come. Uh, we're happy to have you here today. We've got people from all over the place. Uh, interesting people, exciting people, important people, uh, plus one or two of us who aren't, and uh, we're, we're happy to have you. Fernanda, welcome. Uh, all the way from Chile. We're, we're delighted to have you as our speaker this morning. Um, I have only known uh, Fernanda for a very short time. She reminds me that we met about 10 years ago at a scientific meeting, but I don't remember her. She remembers me apparently. Uh, but there are some people here who know her pretty well uh, from the time that she spent at Friday Harbor Labs at the University of Washington. And so uh, I've asked George Von Dassau, uh, an old acquaintance of Fernanda, if he would introduce her this morning, and he happily agreed to do so. So, George, we'll, we'll uh, let you take it over. If you put your you. Um, screen on speaker view, you'll be able to see whoever's speaking on the big screen. Thank you, Craig. I, uh, I met Fernanda when she was a graduate student at the Friday Harbor Labs, and I was a, a post postdoc there. Um, and Fernanda went to Friday Harbor to do her PhD with Richard Strathman, who's, uh, of course, a mentor and friend and colleague to many of us here at OIMB. Um, while she was there, uh, she, of course, TA'd many courses. And I, I happened to um, have the good fortune to have her as a TA, along with Richard himself, for comparative embryology. And I really enjoyed um, doing so. She's not only a natural talent at this sort of thing and a wonderful colleague and co-instructor, but of course, um, no one could fail to catch a little of the gleam in her eye for the wonder and beauty of, of natural creation. And I'm very glad to see her again, even over Zoom. I wish very much she could have visited in person and hope sometime you will. Um, Fernanda uh, earned her PhD for research she did with uh, on the reproductive ecology of a spionid polychaete bacardia, which is this humble little mud-dwelling worm that doubtless nobody but intertidal biologists has ever um, noticed. And in fact, it was from Fernanda that I can probably first remember ever appreciating a spionid at all. Um, Fernanda, was following up with, uh, followed up on work done by others with her own insightful and inspiring study of a really curious fact about this worm's um, biology, which is that within a single clutch of eggs laid by, laid by just one mother, uh, two types of embryos develop and hatch. One is a little one that's gonna take its chances in the plankton as many larvae do to feed and grow and so on. And the other is a big one that's going to um, make its way by eating its siblings. Uh, so that that this phenomenon exists, you know, that it varies within the population or from place to place, is really profoundly important for biologists to uh, try to grapple with how animal life histories evolve. Uh, so I know Fernanda's done many things since um, research, uh, a variety of teaching jobs, art, and no doubt all kinds of other pursuits at all. Um, and per perhaps she'll talk about some of them, so I won't. Um, she's been working in Chile now for many years, but also at sea and around the world. And um, everyone should visit her very beautiful and well done website. Um, there's uh, surely, you would have to be dead not to appreciate at least something on there. Um, why is this person so unusual? Um, why is it so rare for someone to be both a scientist and an artist for real, like not just to paint on the side or something? Um, surely lots and lots of us, many among us got into science out of our sense that by pursuing these studies, we would be, we would be coming into the presence of both truth and beauty too. Many of us might have even had some skills or talents and, and a good eye too. And maybe maybe we 
just forgot to keep those alive alongside scholarship or research, you know, do they really have to exclude each other? So here's a, here's a person today to remind us that they don't. Fernanda. Oh, thank you so much, George, for that um, beautiful in introduction and, and reflection. And it actually ended um, in an amazing, good um, note because that is more or less how I envision this talk. I'm not going to be talking about my dear polykids, although I have earrings of polykids right now, uh, so they're will, with me in some, some way. But um, I'm going to be talking exactly about that interaction of art and science. And I, I have to say that it's an honor to be here, um, even if it's virtually. Um, I lived one year in Santa Barbara, but then nine years in the Pacific Northwest. So a part of my heart is there and it's always lovely to visit. I almost go once a year uh, there for different collaborative projects, but um, even if it's in this case, I am happy to do so in this virtual way. So I'm going to share the screen. And for that, Craig, you have to let me share it. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Just one moment. Okay, sorry about that. You're now the co-host, Fernanda, and you should be able to okay. share your screen. Okay, I'm sharing now, and you'll see it here. There you go, I'm going to move this over here. Okay, so um, thank you so much. I. I uh, put this title, um, and actually I have to warn you that probably I'm going to be talking more about myself and my personal history that is usually normal in science. We tend to be more objective, and that is actually something that um, I might mention in, in another context later. Um, but I'm really interested in processes, and I have become really interested in how, as uh, George pointed out, we are most of us, um, I would say I'm not read that weird in that sense, most of us have multiple interests and talents and passions and um, I'm interested in how those combine in creative ways and especially because nowadays most of the big challenges that we face as humanity, climate change, um, ocean pollution, extinction of a species, really uh, need um, these more holistic persons that at least understand or open to understand what other fields and other and persons working in other fields are doing. So I, I have to, to start by saying that for me, art and science are just two ways in which we try to make sense of the world. Um, we might use very different methods at times, but we share this essence of having a trained eye that looks at the world and asks questions and challenges not only the world and what we know about it, but our own assumptions um, of, of it. Um, and maybe for me, the first time that I started thinking in um, scientific illustration, in um, in, basically in arts and science as a, as a way of, of joining um, um, in a more formal way of actually thinking about it, not just doing it, was through scientific illustration. And maybe this is an image that might be old fashioned for some of you, but it's the kind of images that I had in my mind of these beautiful plates, illustrations that um, naturalists from the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century were doing when they travel around the world and depict um, uh, species that they were describing. Now, um, it's tempting to see these as just the equivalent to photographs. And many of my students, when I make them draw in, in uh, zoology classes or other type of classes, remind, remind me that they have their cell phone. Why should they be drawing? But there is different points uh, in which this is not the same as a photograph. Although I love photographs, by the way, it's, it's another tool that we have. Um, 
but this is especially for example if we see to uh, we see at this drawing of Maria Sibylla, it's a combination of systematic of, of information over time of the interaction of two species, a pollinator and its plants in different stage of development. It is perfectly arranged in a way that you can read the image visually. Um, each organism and each leaf is positioned in a way that tells you something. So it's really telling you a story. And more than just being an image, it's an hypothesis of what the person was looking at and understanding the, the world in, that she was looking at. Um, there is a very interesting book called Objectivity, um, written by Lorraine Deston and Peter Gallison, that actually analyzes the history of objectivity, of, of the actually that epistemological um, virtue that we attribute to science so naturally. Uh, but there was only popular in the 19th century. Be before that, people not necessarily wanted to be objective. And the illustrations and the images that they, they analyze actually depict that, for example, Maria Sibylla, uh, as well as many other illustrators, actually were trying to capture something rather than objective, something that they call true to nature. So they were drawing not what they saw as defects or imperfections that we now call very ability and it's the essence of evolution for us, in that time they wanted to erase that and actually capture the essence of the organism. So it's interesting to me also that, that we can learn about points uh, of view of the hypothesis of the culture of a given time just by looking at the images that science use. And images are not just um, complex images like the one that um, I'm showing, but also images like these, that doodles that we all do. This is one a famous one um, by Darwin, which is the first evolutionary tree. And what I really like about this is that he started saying, um, and writing, I think, and then he ran out of words and had to make a sketch to organize his thoughts. And also, for example, in the case of Ernest Haeckel, he elaborated more on that evolutionary tree a few years later, but here not only you start seeing something more infographic in which it's, it's a combination of information, text and, and images, but also you can see some cultural aspects that permeate into these. that, for example, putting humans at the pinnacle of this tree in the, in the tip, um, and that conveys the view, especially of that time, but still is hard to, to deal with that when one teaches evolution. That is that this vision of nature being directional and evolution basically reaching to us humans as the perfect uh, organism. And we have learned uh, to see it a little bit different now. Um, so one of the aspects that first struck me in between this combination of art and science and scientific illustration had to do with this thing about images and how we select information, organize it, integrate it, integrate it with cultural aspect, with value aspect, and with other things that are implicit. We create internal models and then draw an external model. And this is one of the reasons why in the study of um, pedagogy and how you teach biology or science, drawing has been starting to inter be integrated as an actual tool. It's very different to tell a student or to tell someone tell me what an evolutionary process is, in which you can basically just say a definition that you have memorized, maybe not really understanding, to say, can you draw an evolutionary process and in which you have to actually think and create this model and understanding. Um, but that is one side of arts and science. And in what, that is a uh, side in which you are looking at art more service of science. Another um, way which art can contribute enormously to science, and I'm going to be mentioning it in different contexts. One of these is um, how there, it creates a space, how art can create a space to 
talk about emotions. Uh, we scientists, as, as you see, we have been trying to be objective at least for the last 150 years, and we tend to exclude the human experience many times. But with, when you deal with things like climate change, global warming, ocean acidification, plastics, and so on, and especially when you want to create a modified behavior, we now know that you're not going to just modify people's behavior or create politics and policy around it just with data. Uh, although we wish it could be that case, it's, it's not possible. You need to include emotions, you need to include cultural processes and social aspects. And artists like this Spanish artist, Isaac Cordal, that makes micro installations in, in cities, uh, plays a little bit with this humor and critique and uh, clever ways in calling attention to, to things like global warming and other so socio and ecological issues. Um, now, arts and science collaborations can go very concrete. Um, the artist and sculptor Jason the Kairos Taylor has done these beautiful and interesting uh, sculptures in the um, in the ocean. Basically, they're underwater sculptures which serve a double purpose besides being art. They are also uh, places where settlement can occur. And his project involves working with scientists to create these coral reefs. Um, this creates not only restoration projects and tourist attractions, so that's another way of involving society in this, in this project, but because um, diverse tourists go to these places, it also releases the pressure in the natural reefs, allowing conservation processes and practices to happen in a different way. And also, you feel different when you go to a museum, you tend to go walk slower, be more respectful, pay more attention, and that might also be something um, interesting when people visit these places and might be paying even more attention to these beautiful environments that are in danger. Now, talking about museums, uh, museums started to be popular at the end of the 19th century and 20th century, and many exhibits were done. One of the challenges that um, these natural history museums had is how to display marine invertebrates. And this was one of the solutions that they came up with. When, when you fix an invertebrate um, in alcohol, it becomes sort of a blob, basically. It's not very attractive. But Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka's father and son created these beautiful glass sculptures. Um, they did these for uh, different museums and universities universities, the most famous of the collections is at Harvard and it's of plants and it, it compresses thousands of plants. And this one in particular with of marine invertebrates, it's at Cornell University. And here you can see some of these beautiful creations, which are scientifically accurate and that they gain a new life when uh, Drew Harvell, uh, who works with uh, fish waste disease um, and, and pathogen interaction in, in, in marine invertebrates, among other things. Um, saw them, now she's the curator of them at Cornell, and decided to start looking for the match. So basically she found these boxes of more than 400, 500 species, and she wanted to know if these species still existed. These are European and also from the Pacific Northwest. Here you can see one of the matches. This is Stompia coccinia, a swimming anemone, and here you can see the glass, and here you can see the live uh, organism. And that ended up being a beautiful project, um, that she ended up writing this book, A Sea of Glass, searching for the Blaschka's fragile legacy in an ocean at risk, and so end up being another type of project of conservation. And these beautiful images and models, basically 3D images, um, end up being this time capsule um, that remind us how fragile the ocean is. Now, that are kind of striking ways in which art and science can connect, but maybe I'm pointing back to what George said, there is something more subtle in which art and science can connect. And that is the way in which we are cultivating all our talents and attitudes and aptitudes and interest. And Katie Payne is one of those cases. She is um, acoustic biologist. Um, 
um, she and her husband uh, basically decoded the complex sounds of whale calls. Um, they are at Cornell too. And Katie was trained and she studied in the university both music and biology. And her trained ear not only helped her with her work, um, and decode these this songs, but also when she was at the Portland, uh, Portland um, uh, Zoo, she was near the exhibit of the elephants and she perceived something different, a pressure at, in her ears. I, I have been in the presence of elephants and, and never felt anything in my ear and not a musician or trained musician, but she had this and she felt and something also particular of artists and scientists. She was curious about that. She measured that and she ended up discovering that they communicate through infrasound and not only that, but that most of the communication of elephants happen with infrasounds. This ended up being very interesting, uh, having a very interesting application. For example, a program to determine the size of population in forest areas. Given that uh, you cannot actually do it visually, with the infrasound she, she could determine that. So these kind of things are not unique to her. Uh, there is, of course, another famous scientist that um, we know that he played violin. He, he had this beautiful quote, I live my daydreams in music. I see my life in terms of music, Albert Einstein. And he is famously, when he was stuck with a formula, he started playing violin. But there's also some interesting um, analysis in terms of how much of his theory and his scientific thinking was uh, derived or at least inspired by music itself. Um, there is a very interesting article in this movement from STEM to STEAM. And uh, for some of you that might not know, STEM is science, technology, engineer, and math. This um, new way of a start, well, new 20 years old way <clears throat> of approaching to science education in which is more um, basically based on questions and, and in, in integrated with all these things. And this movement to STEAM in which you add the R uh, the A for art. Um, there is this quote about Nobel laureates in the sciences are 17 times likelier than the average scientist to be a painter, 12 times as likely to be a poet, and four times as likely to be a musician, which is very important to me because I'm not really sure how you are in the States, but here um, I know a little bit about that, but here in Chile, art classes are being cut every year and music and art in favor of math. But we are actually forgetting that we, if we're seeing creativity as bringing imagination into reality and connected things that might not seem connected in interesting and innovative ways, we need to see the world with all our tools, with all our senses and experience it from different angles. Now, it's, it's kind of a hard thing from a jumping from Einstein to me, but humbly, I'm going to just share some of the things that I have been doing in scientific illustration, in ceramic sculpture, and collaborative art and science projects. Um, mainly to share the process because one thing, and I, I'm sorry that I'm not there, but one thing that I really like when, when I'm asked to tell uh, Kind of my experience with art and science is that there's always someone that writes to me afterwards or the approach to me afterwards telling me their own stories about arts and science is including kids at school or high school that have to take the decision of what to study and they tell me i want to study medicine and, and i'm also a musician and i thought i had to give it up and now i think that i can cultivate and it might make me a better doctor so I, I'm going to be, mention very briefly scientific illustration as I, I talked about it before, but I, I use it and, and I, have, um, I have interest in terms of how we visually acquire information with, when we take notes, it forces us to look very closely to what we're looking at, how we synthesize and condense information to schematic images like these or for scientific papers to try to communicate, and also how it's done um, in the research around it when we try to teach. This is one of the projects in which I was involved in the fifth edition of, of a textbook uh, by uh, Pearson. And it's very interesting to look at the images that one uh, creates there in connection to the pedagogy 
uh, the image uh, behind that and what the authors want to say and what, uh, the, what the feedback of the users is. Um, and I still work in scientific illustration part of my time, but my interest right now is mainly focused on how to create a bridge between the needs of science and the increasing interest in scientific illustration. So especially in Chile, we have had a real boom of scientific and naturalistic illustration courses and classes, and a lot of people from design and arts are interested in this. But what happens, um, as a survey from the science ministry show, most Chileans think that science is important. They value science. They think it's important to their own life, but they have no idea where scientists are. Uh, not even they connect them really with universities. So there is work to do. Um, but one thing about that is that scientific illustrators tend, especially if they come from the arts, they don't know really scientists and they don't know how to connect with them and how to illustrate things that are really needed in science. So we start to do these scientific illustration courses in which we take them to marine, uh, marine laboratories, we go to the field with them, uh, show them museum collections. Uh, some of them had never used a microscope. And so show them the, the tools of science, but at the same time, let them explore the techniques and, and, and interact and create communities of artists, scientists that start interacting over time. This year, we had to become creative with the pandemic as all of you have if you teach a class. And so we went virtual. We did um, a course based in the North Patagonia of Chile in the marine lab where I'm an associate. And we did this series of uh, videos. I interview all the researchers of the marine lab. They share images with me. They share um, information, photographs. We reported as a drawing we had zoom calls as many of you are having all these days if you're if you're teaching or learning and it, we created a very interesting community and this is the and a virtual gallery that we created with a, um, a student's project that you can actually visit at artstep.com. Right now it is in Spanish, but at least you can see uh, the, the illustrations and each of them had all the information of the scientists with um, and the research that it, the person is was paired with and, and all the details in relation to that. Um, so that is one side of scientific illustration that has um, still played an important part of my life. But how I end up doing ceramic sculptures, that is a more haphazard uh, for Tutu's event. In 2007, I was spending part of my time this, and this is going to the fields in Falls Bay or uh, looking at plankton in the San Juan Islands. I work in the intertidal zone, so the region that gets exposed with the tide um, retrieves. And um, basically, I love this. It's one of my favorite places on Earth, the inter intertidal zone everywhere, just because it's ecology in one meter square. You see all these amazing adaptations and forms. These are species from Chile. You see and appreciate the diversity and the beauty and the, how they solve problems of both the terrestrial and the marine world. And also you see all these beautiful larvae that I got to, to see um, when I took my um, the comparative uh, embryology class at Ryder Harbor Labs. I spent many times drawing and I'm not sure if George um, knew that, but I actually changed my thesis and my advisor. So Richard was not my first advisor after taking that course. The beauty of the larvae really captured me. And just by curiosity, I end up taking, after I have been taking scientific uh, illustration classes at the certificate of the University of University of Washington and I've been doing other things, I took a ceramic class and I thought it was going to be safe and easy to just do one larvae that I knew very well that this is by Sester, a sea star larvae of a very important sea star in the Pacific Northwest. I have raised this in the lab. I have drawn many times, taken pictures. And Richard Stratman actually had described this species in the 70s, so these drawings were from him. So I thought that that would be a safe thing. And what was striking to me was that when I grabbed the clay in my hands, I, I realized that my hands didn't know how 
exactly that shape was. One thing is to draw it, another thing is to do it in 3D. So that area over there, for example, how, how it goes down, it's it's steep, it's it's how, how steep it is. I mainly have not seen it in this position actually, or nevertheless in this one, because usually it falls in the microscope when you put it to see it frontal or backwards, but not really from above or below. So I had to take the actual clay sculptor still wet to Richard's lab and ask him um, many questions. And I heard something that I have heard since in every science, art science project that I have worked with. This, that he said at some point, uh, that's very interesting. I haven't thought about that. And that is something that repeats and um, interests me is how the artist making questions points out things that one have not think about something because you have seen it always from one angle. Um, this is finally the, the sculpture that I did that is about 70, um, um, centimeters long and I end up giving it as a present to Richard so this was my my first clay sculpture then and since then I have been involved in many different projects in relation to marine organisms not only larvae but for example these are foraminifera so single cell organisms that create these beautiful shells there was a symposium an international actually symposium in Chile and I got asked to do some specific species so I did and that had got me to another thing that is interesting about this art and science collaboration, interact with people that are not specific of my discipline of, or subdiscipline. Something that tends to happen in science is that you get narrow in not only your questions, but your tribe, who you work with. And here I am in, at Eilat in Israel, that I got invited to actually exhibit some of these sculptures and do some sculptures from, from there. And here I'm with a bunch of mainly geologists uh, who were in this conference because it happens to be that foraminifera are really important for geologists and the study of the strata. So I've been learning and expanding my group, although I still work with polychaetes and larvae, uh, I've been looking at other organisms like Emiliana Huxley, a, a coccolithophore. Um, in the above um, images, you can see the microscopic um, SEM images and hear how I started to understand this form and build it in clay. Um, or others like Alexandrum catenella, which is um, the microorganisms that, that causes the red tide in many parts of the world. And this is the main uh, species that creates problem in the region that I lived. And in addition to being interesting to learn about it, and this is just the first sketch of, of it, I still haven't got to do, and, and I actually have it here, I still have not gotten to do the, the following more complex version, but it's very different when you when you had in your hand something that is kind of more ethereal. So many of the of my colleagues have asked me for this model that I keep saying it's just a model, it's just a sketch, but but they still take it to outreach activities or here, for example, if he's a fisherman, they were doing um, some workshops with them explaining the causes of the red tide and other things. It's very different to have it in your hand. And also it's different to have it been done by clay, similarly to the glass of the Blaschka sculptures, when you have something that is fragile and breakable. Sometimes people ask me, why don't I shift to plastic, something that is more resistant, but Kids handle it different. People handle it different. It, it, they handle it kind of as, as something more precious with with their uh, touch, with their, the way they pay attention to it. And this girl actually kind of cutely, she, she hugged it almost as it was a teddy bear. So it, it creates reactions and ways of passing information that is very different to just using your head, basically. Um, this is um, one project called Phylogenetic School that was an art and science fund that was available at the university where I was a uh, full-time faculty at that time. And it's based on the thesis of someone from my department and it's exploring the evolutionary relationships of fishes. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but this is the 
super simplified version of the genetic tree that the person reconstructed in one of the chapters. And what was interesting to me was to try to capture uh, the variation that is present in a population because variation, as I pointed out before, at some point was look at defects, something that you wanted to omit when you represent nature. But now we see that it's the basis of evolutionary processes. And so I wanted to do a school of fishes and I have, was exploring how other artists have represented and they tend to do this kind of mold and just repeat the organism. But I wanted to do it very differently from one to the other. So I had a press mold, but then I shift each individual. I did 102 of these fishes and each of them is slightly different in different ways, including the behavior that is representing. And also I incorporated, I wanted to make visible the genetic, um, the genetics were, that were different in each of them and they were different um, and the source of this evolutionary tree. And I wanted to represent this somehow. So I end up taking this simplified tree and twisting it. Um, basically those two branches over there are these and this one over here is this one over here. This is the European um, sardine. Basically, this is the one from Chile and from New Zealand and from Australia. And here you have the, the school of fishes all assemble. Another important aspect for me uh, in while I was doing this project is that I, I couldn't work in my apartment because it was very little. And so I ended up working in the countryside in, in the house of my um, uh, father and uh, mother-in-law. And people from the countryside were passing by it all the time. And clay is something that we have been working with at least for 20,000 years as human beings. So clay is very close to culture. People feel it very humble and as a very humble material and very close to them, not like marble or uh, bronze or something like that. And so people will pass by and ask me, oh, what are you doing? You're doing, oh, that's a cute little fish. What is that about? And we will enter a conversation that will end up being of evolution and genetics and things that I had never dreamed of just bringing up in a random conversation with a farmer. But it was a very um, easily accessible conversation, put in that way. So I felt clay was an, a gateway to opening conversations in different contexts. In a very different project, uh, but still based on this beauty in biodiversity, um, I explore uh, intelligence in the ocean. So I started doing uh, sculptures of cephalopods, which I still do. I think just um, octopus are amazing. And, and I work with, uh, with um, cuttlefish, with um, um, squids and, 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 and octopus. And I actually got to go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium to take some images. I got to go backstage and see how they're raising them in the lab and, and so on. And I, I started exploring ways of, of showing um, different stories, different science stories. So not only looking at the organism, but also looking at the science that is behind and how you tell the story. And this is one of the cases um, in which I start making the science behind much more visible and not only the science, but the scientist behind more visible. Uh, this in this case is my hand because it was the hand that I, ha I had more at hand, basically, but it, it represents scientists. It represents it, not only scientists, but us humans trying to understand this organism. And I put texts and images from the 19th century to the paper from last year talking about the genetics of it, all in, uh, printed in, in, there was a transfer of images in, in this hand. And this caused two things. One is like, I wanted to show how we approach and touch the world with all our senses, but also we carry a lot of knowledge with us when we approach it. We are not a, a blank slate. And the other is that I start to play with this balance that is always hard for me of how to make something that is scientifically accurate and at the same time to be something that is good as science and 
and something that is ambiguous, that is something that is needed to make an art piece interest, interesting. And also I got to see that people will spend more time with the pieces because they will ca get caught in this thing written in them and start reading in it and trying to make sense of it. And if, if you know a little bit about art, you might know that um, usually people spend between five and six seconds looking at that art piece in, in a gallery or museum. So anything that captures their attention might make them stay with your piece a little bit longer and maybe reflect on it a little bit longer. Um, as an ecologist, it has been interesting to see how the environment affects, uh, in this case, the pieces. Um, how they get read by people that visit, it's very context dependent. And this particular sculpture of the Nautilus that is called Origin um, has been exhibited in context like this, that is a cephalopod uh, conference in, Cre in Greece, in the Crete Aquarium. Um, in art and science exhibits, um, and also as models in, um, in a natural history museum. And it doesn't hurt at all my ego or feelings if someone calls this piece a model, or if it's called it art, or, or however they wanted to call, because actually I'm interested in that. I'm interested in how people look at it, and it might open up conversation um, in different ways. Now, another piece of that of that bigger project is this one, Escaping from Plastic, which is the Tiloe octopus that is a relative of the, your giant octopus. Um, these, I wanted, in this case, I wanted to portray how this octopus starts running, you know, basically, well, not really running, but escaping. Um, because it, it, it is interesting to me to think that octopus have a more diffuse nervous system and when they escape kind of their arms that can take some independent decisions um, kind of get turned off when they have to escape and that's why you see kind of the head and the, uh, the arms being left kind of behind um, a little bit um, like dropping them. So I wanted to just capture that beginning of the moment um, and I wanted to make it that is escaping of something, I didn't quite know what to put on it. And once again, not really thinking too much about it, I entangled it with a plastic bag, um, being that plastic is such an, an issue, but never really wanted necessarily to address that. And the most interesting thing about this piece is how people have reacted to it. So whenever I have placed it in an exhibit in a gallery, or when I have taken this sculpture to give a talk at a high school or an elementary school, someone looks at the piece and thinks that the plastic bag was left by someone. So they get annoyed. So it's like, oh my God, someone left a plastic bag and they want to go and remove it. And then they realize that it's part of the sculpture. And then they do this swing of going back and forth of, of, of shock. But that is specifically for kids. It's a great moment to start talking about, okay, why you got angry because of the plastic bag being in the gallery, but you don't get equally angry when you see that plastic bag in the beach. And we start talking about uh, the, the causes of pollution of plastic bag and what it does to animals and so on. But that is a way in which you enter um, sort of like from the back door um, to the conversation of plastics. You don't start with a graph and data, but it was, you start with a very raw gut emotion of anger or of getting pissed off at people that do something and then entering from there to that conversation, which it's, it's interesting to try to do it. And as I've been saying, um, artists are now becoming more and more invited <laughs> to science talks and conferences and different things. And one of the things that have become um, interesting is both that they get involved in research and that they get involved in um, art arts and science residencies. So artists actually in science places. This is one particular project that we did um, in conjunction with the um, US Embassy in Chile. Um, we are for, it's called Ask to Defer, so art and science knowledge building and sharing in the 21st century. And we are four women, um, Genevieve uh, is an artist from Seattle and Nelida and Belen work in the in terrestrial ecology, both PhDs and, and, and both uh, work in both worlds. And what we wanted to, uh, was to do a pilot program and one year 
pilot program in which we open did an open call and professionals from different realms of arts and science from Chile, 10 of them were selected. And we did an exploration from for, through the Pacific Northwest. We went to Friday Harbor, we went to uh, Microsoft, we went to um, University of Puget Sound, we went to labs, we went to the field, to uh, Mount St. Helen and so on. And also we did the same in Chile and we compare how arts and science can explain different uh, processes and projects and we end up creating um, an exhibit at the end and so on. Um, but actually this might be even more interesting than that. It is that the normal projects that are equivalent to NSF is now the Ministry of Science and Need um, had these, for example, this excellence in research, uh, Nucleus Millennials, uh, Millennium Nucleus. And this one in particular is called MUSELS. And it's actually not misspelled, it's an acronym, so it doesn't have two S's. But they, um, this is um, multiple university researchers' efforts in trying to understand socio-ecological uh, problems and dynamics and ecosystems that, and how uh, that, um, and what is the response of that for climate change? So how these communities in the north of Chile, and this is in Tongoy, that um, work in, in aquaculture with um, scallops are here in the south, um, that most of the mussels that are exported from Chile come from the region where I live in, how people are adapted to climate change. So in these projects, there are economists and sociologists and, and, and scientists, but also they have this money that is more or less for outreach, but they specifically ask not to give talks. They want people to do something more, to, to do more interested. And, and several of these nucleus of these um, centers of research have done arts and science projects. Among the different projects that I've been working with them for the past two years, one had to do with the first of how to do a sculpture of climate change. And so I, I basically base in this uh, Lilliput um, and giant among Lilliput idea, um, I've been working trying to bring little things into large sculptures or larger sculptures, and this was the opposite problem. And so I created this uh, little girl that would be playing with the scientists, the basically the sociological factors um, in the, this adaptation to climate change, uh, uh, all the stories that I would see, was seeing in the field. And I, as usually is recommended now in communication of science, I wanted to show the process. So I took this um, sculpture while I was doing while I was making it, so basically have have done, still working on it, to uh, the kids were in the village, in the fisherman's village where we were working. The kids were also monitoring environmental variables. They were learning things. These cubes represent all the chemi uh, uh, chemical um, compounds of you know, the acidification process. And they did also their own sculptures and the whole stories. And they have um, this particular sculpture right now. It's in a gallery in in, in here in the town where I live in with other arts and science projects. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I was being interviewed by a SOC um, about climate change and talking to children uh, using this. So especially with climate change, a problem that we have now is climate anxiety. Um, how you talk to children about these complex things of a collapsing future. And art is a way of not only talking about that, but imagining new possibilities. And one thing that was unexpected for me from when I started collaborating, this is I had never done murals, but people in the community really wanted a mural, like they really wanted. So they request me to do a mural and we end up co-constructing, co-creating a mural with um, one of the um, schools there, high school, that is also a technical school. So they get trained in aquaculture and there are actually labs inside where scientists actually work with the students. And they design the, this was the first mural, but we are in the third mural right now, the different stories from uh, the different species that live there to the town, to um, the buoy where data is collected by scientists. And we are actually this year working in, in four fishermen villages along Chile, working with murals in, in the fourth of, uh, in the 
four places and because of the pandemic we have gone virtual so we are doing a virtual mural in all of these cases and we will paint it next year um, as I said, there is another approach that is having artists do art at seas residencies or art at lab residences and, so, and so on. This is the particular program of the Smith Ocean Institute in which I participated. I could talk, could talk a lot about this experience because although it was short, it was really transformative for me. Um, but I'm going to just point out a few things. First, that I thought I was going to be working with animals of the deep sea, and I was so excited about that, until I found out that the e exploration was on autonomous robots. <laughs> it actually was partially um, um, sponsored by NASA. And so most of these uh, scientists are researchers uh, from the areas of engineer and in computer programming and some of them are geologists. So I was uh, basically worried of what I was going to do. I couldn't see myself actually doing a clay sculptures of robots, but I soon realized what was so interesting to me in this exhibit, uh, in this ex expedition, besides of course the beautiful animals that appear, um, it's the process of science itself and the humanness behind te technology. So I really loved uh, spending time with them. Fortunately, Richard Camilli, who was the PI of the exhibit, of the expedition, sorry, I keep saying exhibit, of the expedition, um, he also was a sculptor himself. So he really allowed me to be in all meetings and be part of, of the expedition to be looking at the decisions that they were taking and, 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 and doing. And I end up asking each of the scientists to pick a position of the hands that represent their role in the expedition. And they took it very seriously. They thought like about two or three days about it and keep coming with questions to me. This is Richard Camilli, the PI, and this is what he picked, basically kind of holding a radio, a telephone. He basically, he said he spent most of the day directing other people what to do in this expedition. And I transformed that into data in machine-like structures. I then transfer images of that process of getting the information until there are graphs and so on. Um, but one cool thing was that I was working with clay in the same room where they were working with engineer equipment and computers and, and, and gliders and so on. And of course, the coolest thing ever was that they offer to take clay sample from the bottom of the ocean, so 1740 uh, meters under the sea level. And I got to do part of the sculpture with that clay, that is the Sebastian the robot taking that sample. That clay actually ended up being here. I took it back to to my studio. Um, I end up doing different tests and I mix half and half with another clay that I had to elevate the point at which it gets uh, harder in, in, the, in the kiln. And after some tests, I, I could continue working in some of the, of the uh, pieces for that project. And as you notice, one of the geologists here asked me to do the foot, not the hand, because it was much more important for him. Um, and these end up being a very different sculpture than anything I have done before. It's, it's you know, it doesn't have the beauty organism there. And, and for me, it was this capture of the cacophony of a collaboration. So this point in research that is hardly depicted, that is that a little bit of an entropy and chaos that happens when different people come together and they're brainstorming and researching. And uh, here is some of that um, transfer of images of their notes and so on, and each of these hands tell its own story. This was part of an exhibit this past February in the Ocean Science Meeting that took place in, in San Diego. Uh, I got to see, and I was very happy how people will be looking at it and reading the, the text and trying to make sense of it and create a story around it. And I was very highly impressed on how that big meeting had a huge presence of art and science project. There were workshops and talks. I also got to give a talk about Ask 21st in addition to, to this uh, residency. And maybe one of the things that I didn't expect um, is this beautiful, beautiful, uh, amazing talk at the beginning of this the whole conference by nine 
Nainoa Thompson, a native Hawaiian that um, have reclaimed the knowledge of um, the traditional Polynesian art of navigation without modern instruments in their traditional canoas. And um, his talk was amazing and it's recorded if in any of you is interested in, in seeing it. But for me, it was very important to see how traditional knowledge could open a scientific conference. And, it, and it's, I think it's a, it's a really good sign that we as scientists are not only open to interdisciplinary work, but to other forms of knowledge and knowing and getting more involved with culture in general. And for me, that thing about touching the, the clay in, from the bottom of the ocean had also some kind of deep um, transformation with me. It, it was, it felt very different to working with clay that you know, knew came from a very specific place. And that got me, that happened in 2018, at, in December, that got me all last year to start investigating clay techniques. Um, of pre-Columbian times. And these are some images of a workshop I, I took in Argentina, um, in the communities, how, how the culture is mixed and impregnated. She's Adriana Martinez, a, a researcher and of pre-Columbian techniques. She has gone all through Latin America exploring how um, clay was worked before um, the Spanish um, arrival and she works with museums and she's trying to retrieve some knowledge that got lost um, with the colonization process. And I have I've gotten to see different types of interaction. This is a conference in the north of Chile. He's a scientist from Peru and he's an artist, a musician and also ceramic artist and they are recovering the sound of many instruments instruments that no one knows how they sound and how they were played. In, in, in Latin America, hundreds of different instruments were done with clay traditionally, and we're just starting to learn some of them. And these are also some of the pieces that are made with uh, shells. And that got me and following again my curiosity to start exploring what we had in Chile, we planned and unfortunately because of the of the pandemic, we had to cancel. In May, we were going to do a scientific illustration course based in marine research, but also in the um, original um, First Nations of, of Chile. So using the material of this uh, pre-Columbian arts museum. So we hopefully will do it next year. And as my mother used to say, uh, not, nothing that you learned is wasted. You never know how you're going to connect different things. Um, this is a project that I'm working on. Um, with an artist uh, that is called uh, Symbiosis, a woman creators from the Andes to the ocean. Uh, these are just some explorations and this is contemporary sculpture, but actually the burnish burnishing, um, which is getting a piece of stone and passing it in the, through the surface of the clay, pressing it and compressing it in a way that creates resistance and shine had helped me, that is basically a pre-Columbian technique, has helped me go much more thinner than I usually go in clay and start to capture in, in this case, macrocystis, which is an algae that is important in the south of Chile, but also in, in your side of the world. And so um, we are continuing working in different projects, um, arts and science collaborations like the Biennale Concepcion of Art and Science. I'm one of the co-directors of this initiative, have joined three different universities in the Concepcion area. And we are working with the community, we're working with fishermen, we're working with architects, we're working musicians. They did a piece in this 2019 version that is the music of the shine of a star. So basically it's a collaboration with an astronomer and um, other things that happen here. And just as a final thought, um, I really like this image. She is uh, Luisa, which is a scientist with whom I collaborate. And the three of them are algueras. So they're women from, from Caleta del Manzano, from a, a, a fisherman's village. And they are learning to, to use instruments to measure um, their, their environment for climate change. But I really like this image because it, it summarizes many of the things that I'm thinking about collaboration and art and science projects and art and science 
science and community projects that most of the success of, of it I have seen in, in this thing, in spending time together, spending time in the places, observing much of the time listening more than talking and having an horizontal um, predisposition of knowledge. Um, people have usually a lot to tell and hopefully uh, we can continue working together and to an horizon that we might or might not reach. But I, I think that if there is any hope in many of the challenges that we're confronting had to do with this interdisciplinary, socio and ecological integration of, of knowledge. Um, and that's it. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Fernanda. That was absolutely remarkable and perhaps the broadest perspective of any talk I've ever heard uh, for a scientific seminar. Um, I'd like to ask everybody to turn their videos back on and then once that happens, we'll uh, give uh, Fernanda a round of applause. I'm gonna take one picture of you guys. Here you go. <laughs> oh. Excellent. Can we, uh, uh, are you willing to answer some questions or oh, engage? Oh, please. That is the, the funniest part. I have heard myself before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I bet somebody has a comment or a question for Fernanda. I would yeah. like to comment. Uh, it's not a question. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Fernanda. This was such a wonderful, uh, inspired and inspiring talk. I nearly cried. <laughs> It's really, um, it just, it, it's such an amazing thing to, to hear you speak of your personal experience and, and how art and science are deeply connected and how it's um, such an such a important part of human experience. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was also very impressed. The sculptures are just amazing. Um, and um, uh, the U, U of O has a comic science fellowship um, that they've been doing, and they're doing it the second time for a second time this term, where they pair up researchers and artists and have the artists do um, like about a 10 page comic describing the research. And I'm doing the um, art part for one of them this term. And it's the first time I'm doing any um, scientific illustration properly. And um, I'm very intimidated by doing something even slightly outside like my like what I've like learned and studied uh some i don't know i'm wondering what you would recommend for someone doing that for the first time or like what mm -hmm. types of things you think um of, what type i should look at before starting and things like that yeah i i think that usually it tends to go more than artists are more intimidated than scientists than the other way around but it happens in 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 many cases uh, when there is art and science and collaboration that w what uh, stops it for being successful is this thing of trying to defend how much you know like as soon as you forget your ego and like you're probably going to make yourself you know full of yourself at some point and and that is okay that's the great part because what you know the other person doesn't know and we're you are both experts and ignorant at the same time and the most you forget about trying to keep an appearance of knowing the more you're going to arrive sooner to the cool parts of the research and collaboration and, and listening a lot that also helps like sometimes it's good to tell your story and your vision but sometimes pay attention to what people do what they say what they don't say that's always super interesting what they don't do um, things that might look minute end up being the most interesting part of the research and the collaborations so keep an open mind that's the, the main thing All right, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So how has how has the coronavirus affected your work? Oh, wow. In all sorts of ways. Um, so basically, it, it, it has been both a complication in many things. For example, we had this project to do in this year, which I actually have the fundings, you know, I have to give my report to the funding agency in a month of this 
four murals we were going to paint and I haven't been able to get outside Puerto Varas. And so we had to move the whole project uh, from from working directly to the virtual world. And some of these schools are um, rural, so they don't even have good signals. So we've been trying through WhatsApp and Facebook connections and you know whatever works for them. And the good side has been that with some of those schools now we're meeting weekly. Instead of going once to do one thing, we, we have been meeting weekly since March to now, and they're doing activities and we have been visiting their classes and so on. And we have moved to the virtual world. So we are creating all these uh, murals virtually. We are going to print postcards and send them to them. And they're going to write those postcards with the virtual mural that now print it and bring it back to us. We're working with virtual reality, augmented reality. And so we basically, every problem is also an opportunity to become more creative. And the one thing that we decided right away is like, we're going to make this work somehow, even if we have to rewrite the whole thing. And we talked to the funding agency and they were super happy with this. We ended up working, I, I would say, like four times more than we were expected to be working, but it has become uh, really interesting. So, so yeah, at the Biennale of next year that we're organizing is the same thing. We don't know if it's going to be virtual or presence, if it's going to be big, small, how much of the, you know, thing is going to be affected, but we're doing it. And we are just... Uh, every session discussion is a brainstorming session on what if scenario A, B, C, and D. And of course, we have also the social uphill here, elections and all of that. We we painted one of those murals that I show images last year, the first week that the social uphill started. So there was curfew and people will come and tell us that, you know, you have to go because the militaries are coming and we'll have to go back and then go out and but that creates bonds with the community so it has affected in every possible way that you think but it's it's like science you, you think you're going to do something and um, as William uh, Kentridge which is a South African South African artist said um, sometimes the best work happens in between the work you thought you were doing I'd just like to say I thought it was a remarkable marriage of art and science. And I have a question for Craig. Are, is OIMB still doing um, classes in scientific illustration? Uh, hi, Kathy. Yes, yes, we are. Um, we actually have been teaching classes in scientific illustration for at least 20 years that I know of and probably much, much longer than some of the others would remember. Um, we have one of our alumni who's a professional uh, scientific illustrator, John Megahan, and John is very, very good. And he comes every spring and teaches a course that has students not only in biology, but students from the art department and students from other places. Uh, it's, it's a long tradition here. That's wonderful. And also, are you still doing the um, uh, scholarship program at the high schools? for um, some of those types of classes? Um, I should ask Maya or Trish that, I think. I, I don't know of uh, that sort of a scholarship. I think it was a Terwilliger scholarship. I'm, I'm not familiar with, with anything like that at the high school. Okay. It was a great program at any rate, but it was many, many, many years ago. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah, um, I don't Fernando, you made a those. very good point early on about how physical art has an impression upon people when they touch it, when they hold it, they react very strongly to it when they see it in person. Have you encountered any trouble getting that impact to students or to others using visual, using digital and virtual art? Because I personally use a lot of digital supplies because they're cheaper, they're easier to access. In Coos Bay, there are no metalworking studios I'm aware of, and I don't have a workspace here, so I try to do everything digitally. Do you have any recommendations on how to get that same impact without having people touch the art? Yeah, well, now actually touching the art, is, it's hard because 
by protocols in many ways you cannot do because of COVID. Um, for, for example, the Biennale, we had designed this kind of, uh, what we call dispositivos la mar. So it, it was this thing that if people were going to put their heads and listen, uh, soundscape is something that I become interested in. And now we are thinking in things like um, things that are activated if you get nearby you know with arduino and other things so you don't have to actually touch them so we're starting to explore that i uh go in between the digital world and clay uh, almost like a pendulum because i feel that both gives you a completely different uh, perspective i like actually playing with the integration of them um i saw uh oh god i forgot her name good to well, there's a, a very famous artist that works with clay, uh, with clay, with glass in Seattle, and she did an installation with uh, glass sculptures that it was like a forest, but you could actually pass your phone on top of it. It was like cat trees, and you will see them blooming in augmented reality. And so it was beautifully done, this integration of both. I, you know, I do a lot of scientific illustration with with digitals uh, because it's much faster um you can also do undo <laughs> which you can undo in the real world which is terrible and also amazing because it forces you to take decisions but i i would say um you know it's exp the the materials themselves generate different questions in you from how to do them and how to apply them and generate different emotions in different people. So rather than trying to justify why one takes one or the other, I think it's explore its potential. How much can you do with that? How much you can combine it with other things? Uh, for example, the clay thing for me has been amazing now to start collaborating with uh, paleo uh, oceanographers that are reconstructing, you know, the currents based on the deposition of clays. And I'm going to be sampling next week with one of them because we have seen the high levels of heavy metals in areas where people extract clay uh, culturally. And it was one of the places that she's working. So I would not have arrived to that questions uh, of you know paleoceanography if I was just in the digital world. But I also arrived to digital world questions uh, in different ways. I'm not sure if I was too all, all over the place, but that was kind of my my thoughts um, based on your question. No, that was great. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this talk. Thank you. Looks like George has a question. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Fernanda. And I hope you, uh, by the way, look at the chat before um, this closes down to see comments left by others. Um, I had a question kind of related to museums and exhibits. And so I think your phylogenetic school is really brilliant. And I'm, I would love to see it in person. I'm sure I would spend more than five or seven seconds that you quoted for the typical <laughs> time that a museum goer engages with a piece of art. I, I would, and, but I'm not sure I would with the hands. I'm sure it's a really rich piece to the people who, whose hands they are in particular and to you. And, but you've explained it. You've related the story of its creation and what it means in such a way that now I would. And, and this is so often what's missing from exhibits and museums. What you've given us today about much of your work is this is so often missing from artists' presentations uh, that the rest of us can engage with. What what do you think about that? Well, it's exactly the same that happens with science. That's the thing. Yeah, uh, no. Process. People see the final paper, which usually are so dry or just one headline, and they don't know all the beautiful, amazing stories behind how you got, you know, where 
grabbing a kelp because the tide was pulling you and there was a wave and then data. So all of that richness in the experience of both the creation of art and science for me is the most wonderful thing. And that's why I base my talks in that. I think that when I start talking about how you do research to an artist, they get fascinated and something that they thought it was boring and just piles of facts that they should memorize, they just see it live. Um, so that's why, for example, that in Instagram, I I post a lot of my process in, in arts and how I'm doing a sculpture and in fast motion or slow motion or different angles and this thing exploded in the kiln, the failures. Uh, so all of those things I think are, are rich. And, and also many times I don't do the classical art gallery thinking you try to be obscure and you just put one, you know, piece number 78 that doesn't tell you anything about that. I usually go kind of, this is the species and, and put a link so you can actually engage and explore and, and give talks and at the, for example, for this um, exhibit that we have here, we have been doing weekly Instagram live talks with, with some of the collaborators. So uh, try to open the conversation. It's, it's good to have a little bit of an enigma in art um, because it makes you wonder. Um, but, but I don't think you have to be especially um, obscure in your processes because that's the, the richness for for example that thing of having clay from the bottom of the ocean to clay like clay artists is the coolest thing they have ever heard like it's like how you did that it's like th that's more interesting than even what, what i did with it um but that starts a conversation of how research is done what's that boat about why you were there what they were doing and and you end up talking the, similarly to the fish you end up talking to something that an artist might never had cared before about and now they they're interested and they want to go in an, ex an expedition with a scientist uh, Fernand, I was I was really fascinated by by your graphic that showed what percentage of Nobel Prize winners are are, are musicians and poets and artists. I'd be I'd be curious. I'll, I'll, I'll bet a lot of the people in your audience today engage in one of those activities, maybe just as a hobby. Could I see by a show of hands how many of you have an art hobby or a music hobby or a or a poetry hobby or anything like that? You see. It's, mo it's almost everybody. Almost everybody mm -hmm. does this in, in one in one form or another. And so I think you've, you've really touched a lot of people here today. Uh, are there any final questions for Fernanda? George? I had another that I was curious to hear your thoughts on. Um, you don't sound like an artist some, sometimes when you're talking. Um, I'm, in, the following, in the following sense, you didn't talk about self-expression and, and, and the kinds of things that, so you might remember Ellery, um, he just, about a year ago, he finished his BFA. You don't talk the way art students are told in, in schools that they need to talk about their work. You talk about trying to capture things and, and to and to bring something out about them, and 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 so I wonder how you feel about the the kind of at least the sort of um, here in the U.S. the the <laughs> at least the academic art um, attitudes of the focus on seemingly focus on self-expression and statement and. Uh, I don't, I don't know exactly how to put it in, in brief, but maybe you do. Yeah, um, like like in Nemo, when it says uh, the speaking whale, I always say don't speak art in that sense. Like, I don't know how to sound convoluted about my work. Uh, like some artists do an amazing thing of just, I have no idea what they're talking about. But that's, 
that's a percentage. That's the thing. And I gave a talk at um, UDAP Ceramics uh, in, the, in April, and that was amazing. Um, and, and because I learned ceramics there, it was really cool to give a talk to, you know, MFA grad students and, and professors there. And at, at some point, I was a little bit worried that, like, what is it that I'm missing um, that I cannot talk like that? And, and it, but at first, I started learning more about how they express. So when you go into different fields, you, you, you start understanding, you know, oh, you, you don't say that word beautiful for us in science is really a cool word to use. You almost never tell an artist that something is beautiful. It sounds so basic, you know, so it's interesting because this and that are beautiful. It's almost an insult sometimes. And, and so, there's all this language that is richness. Um, but on the other hand, I, at the beginning, I was worried that I felt that I always was the artist among the scientists and I always was the scientist among the artists. And how could I try to fit in and speak in different ways? And um, now I see that as incredible freedom. I don't have to fit in because I'm in between. I'm the artist, I'm the scientist. And, and that gives you some freedom and people tolerate that you don't necessarily have to fit in in the same way. Or, you know, I'm the Chilean in, in the States and so on. So I, I would say that as anything, um, one tends to fit in in science too. It happens, but when one is inside science, you don't really notice. Um, the way we dress, the way we speak, it's its very particular of our tribe. And it depends also in which part of the world you are and in which field you are. Geologists speak slightly different than, you know, physiologists and ecologists. So it, I, I think that that's the human in us. And we are not objectives. We, we have these cultures and subcultures in science, in art. And, and art happened to be a very steep pyramid also, like people that work in the high spheres of, of big recognition and exhibits, it's, it's different than most of artists. Most of artists actually, especially in Chile, are not rich people in big, huge galleries. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's different. And so, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to me what, what you're pointing and um, but I, I tried not to, to, to change the way that I work now because of it. I'm going to uh, ask one final person to ask a question. I saw his hand earlier. This is Seth. Uh, Seth, you'll have the final question. And uh, Seth is actually a very accomplished musician as well as a, as a student of marine biology. So go ahead, Seth. God bless you, Craig. Thank you so much. I don't know if you can hear, but there's like lawn mowing outside. So I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to try to get my question across. Um, so you talked very briefly about restoration with the underwater sculptures, mm -hmm. um, uh, as well as being them being art. And I was wondering, once you said that, it got me thinking, um, are, are you in a way interfering with the, ec uh, with the ecosystem that's underwater there once you do a restoration project? Because, I don't know, if someone, by hurting, let's say, something down there, you could affect the eco ecosystem, and that's not good. So by doing a restoration project, is that also harmful? How, how do scientists go about thinking about this of whether that restoration pro uh, project is actually, you know, by interfering maybe with nature or the ecosystem, it's gonna be hurtful? I've, I've wondered this and I don't know how to answer this. Yeah, I, I don't have all the details of, of each of the projects that he has done. Um, I know that he collaborates with scientists in doing so. And I think that what you pose is an interesting question in restoration in general, but restoration is by definition, you're intervening a place with a purpose. And what you restore to is always a question. Um, you're restoring to something that happened before you know, an oil spill, or you're restoring something that happens to 10 years or 20 years or a decade, or you you know, or a uh, hundred years and so on. So f for me, restoration, it's, it's, I think I don't work in that, but that's always tricky. I would assume that if you're going to do a project like that, in which you are using art in a restoration project and things like that have been used also in the coast, for example, in areas where they build something to stop waves, for example, and, and, and do an art project with that, First, you're intervening in a place that already have some sort of damage. And so you're 
doing a, a study of the impact that was done before before you place and the other thing is that you should do a monitoring before and after and understand maybe maybe those sculptures scare some fishes i i don't know um maybe seeing humans under the water is scaring for some mammals or an octopus i i don't know and those are all interesting questions so um th that's um it, it, now you make me curious of going more in depth to see how much of that has been done. But um, it, the basic thing would be you are not going to put a sculptor in 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 a place that is more pristine. It's uh, hopefully given that you're going to restore an area, uh, become more creative about that in which you can, for example, in this case, create a place that focuses the tourism in that area and not in others that are more natural and pristine. Um, but it's, I think it's an excellent question. Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, with that, I think we will uh, we'll end the official session, but I'm definitely going to leave the, uh, the session open for a little while because Fernanda has probably 20 extremely complimentary ch tweets that, or um, chats that she needs to read uh, before she signs off. So um, let's give uh, Fernanda a round of applause once again. A really superb seminar. Inspiring was a word that was often used in the chats, you'll find out. And uh, with that, we'll uh, excuse everybody. If somebody wants to engage uh, with Fernanda just a little bit longer, uh, the session will be open and you, you can remain if you wish. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.